Hello. Good morning. Good to see you today. You want to grab your outline so you can follow along with the message today. We have a lot of stuff to cover in today's message. We welcome you who are watching online. Glad you could be with us as well. I know uh, there are a lot of people that are sick at this time of year. How many of you, sometime in the past three years, have had COVID? Raise your hand. A yeah, number of you. Good number of you. Back in the fall of 2020, I had COVID. And I thank God that uh, I didn't have to be put on a ventilator, but I did get pretty sick. For days, I could barely crawl to the bathroom. One of the worst parts for me was this lingering fatigue. For many days, I couldn't do anything except stare, look, and stare forward. It was miserable. Just barely moving a muscle was exhausting. I gradually got better, of course, but the fatigue only slowly diminished for many weeks after the virus had gone. I felt powerless, useless, incapable. Many of you can relate. Many of you have had it much worse. But there's a fatigue that's hit the church in our country, in the Western world, even harder than COVID hit it. It's a spiritual fatigue that drains away your appetite for God's Word, for prayer, for fellowship, for worship, for sharing your faith with unbelievers. It depletes your resistance to temptation. You feel weak and barely able to serve or even make it to church yourself, much less bring a friend along with you. You may be healthy and peppy in body and in mind, but your soul feels half asleep, half starved, half dead. Maybe that's you now. Or maybe you've been there, but you still haven't fully recovered. It's like the virus is gone, but the fatigue lingers. What can you do? Well, last Sunday, we started a new series called The Life and Times of the Holy Spirit. We learned that the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, was present and active at the moment of creation. We found that he gives us the breath of life. And we found that uh, we as sinners rebel against him. We defy him. We resist him. And yet, he convicts us. He convinces us. He woos us to turn from sin to Christ for forgiveness and new life. Today, we're seeing how the Holy Spirit empowers us to live our lives for Christ. He gives you strength. He gives you courage. When you're weak, he, he gives you supernatural abilities. In short, the Holy Spirit is the cure for spiritual fatigue. He gifts you with supernatural abilities. And he transforms you from a wimp to a wonder. And we're going to see that today. The title of our message is Getting Empowered. Getting Empowered. We left off last week in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible. And today we're picking up there and we're doing a, 
a whirlwind tour of the Holy Spirit's work in the Old Testament. It's all wrapped up in our main idea, the one thing you want to remember if you forget everything else I say. If you're taking notes, I hope you are, you'll want to write it down. It goes like this. A superior experience with the Holy Spirit awaits you. It awaits you. Perhaps you've heard about that great day, that enormously powerful day when the Holy Spirit came upon the early Christians. We call it the day of Pentecost. It was 10 days after Jesus ascended bodily into heaven. That day was the game changer. That day was the turning point. It was pivotal. That day, the day of Pentecost, recorded in Acts chapter 2, marked a new beginning. That day, everything changed in regard to the way the Holy Spirit deals with us. Today, we're looking at what it was like for God's people before Pentecost. That is, BP. That's how we're abbreviating it today. Before Pentecost. And what we can learn from that. We're looking at three lessons about the Holy Spirit's BP, before Pentecost, activity. The first one is point one on your outline. He imparts supernatural abilities. Now, if you don't like driving fast or roller coasters, you might not like this point because we're going to zoom through some Old Testament passages here really quickly uh, that show us how the Holy Spirit supernaturally empowered Old Testament believers to do what they could never do in their own strength, with their own personalities. The first, we have several listed here, is interpreting dreams. We pick up in, in Genesis chapter 41, verse 38. This is in Pharaoh's court. So Pharaoh asked them, help me out with the yellow print, can we find anyone like this man, get this, in whom is the Spirit of God? You notice it is not capitalized, this, because it comes from a pagan who's observing this, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. What's going on here? Well, in the story, a godly man by the name of Joseph, a believer in the Lord, the one true God, has just interpreted two troubling dreams for the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the most powerful man in the world. The dreams had baffled Pharaoh's wisest men, his, his priests, his holy people. But Joseph's interpretation of the dreams proved amazingly accurate. By predicting the future, God uses him to save not only Egypt, but all the surrounding nations, and even Joseph's family, the family of Israel, interpreting dreams. Let's look at a second ability, and that is artistic ability. Here we move into Exodus chapter 35. It says, God has filled Bezalel with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood and engage in all kinds of artistic crafts. This is so cool. Artistic ability granted by the power of the Holy Spirit. This fellow Bezalel was given this ability to construct the Ark of the Covenant, the furniture for the tabernacle and the tabernacle itself. Artistic ability. 
Let's look at the next one, leadership ability. One time Moses, the great leader of Israel, got burned out, terribly burned out. He's trying to lead all these people and they're complaining and he gets to the point, maybe you've been there in your work or your ministry where he just says, forget it. I just can't do this anymore. I just don't have it anymore. I'm out of it. God, I want to quit. I want to die. That's what he tells the Lord. And so the Lord has mercy on him and he says in to, to, to uh, Moses in Numbers chapter 11, verse 17, I, the Lord, will come down and speak with you there, and I will take some of the power of the Spirit that is on you and put it on the 70 elders of Israel. Help me. They will share the burden of the people with you so that you will not have to carry it alone. This is a fascinating scene. God places the Holy Spirit that's on Moses and kind of spreads it out to the other leaders so that they can share this burden of leadership responsibility. And I I think it's interesting to note that even though Moses is filled with the Spirit, he can still he can still struggle and still get burned out and he needs help. Now what pastor, what parent has not come to this point and wished for this kind of ability? Let's look at a fourth one and that is superhuman strength. We move to the book of Judges, chapter 14, verse 6. Here he is again, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. Samson. He's the superman of the Old Testament, but unlike Clark Kent, who's still the man of steel, even when he's you know, a mild manner reporter for the Daily Planet and he's still strong and nobody knows it. That's not the case with Samson. Samson is just an ordinary guy, really and truly, unless, until the Holy Spirit comes upon him in power and he becomes the Incredible Hulk. He can tear apart a lion. He can defeat a whole army by himself. He can uh, tear down a stadium with his bare hands. And yet, Samson is not an honorable man. Samson's a rascal. Read read his, his story there in Judges. He has the spiritual maturity of a of an amoeba. And yet, if the Holy Spirit can empower a deeply flawed man like Samson, think of what he can do with you and me. Let's look at the fifth one here, and that would be prophetic ability. It says in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6, uh, the Lord speaking to Saul, this would be King Saul uh, coming in a uh, very soon, it says, the Spirit of the Lord will come powerfully upon you, Saul, and you will prophesy with them. Now what's happening here? Well, these words are spoken by the, the prophet uh, Samuel to another deeply flawed man. Saul, King Saul, the Holy Spirit would come on him and he would become Israel's first king. And the first confirming sign that the Holy Spirit really had come upon him was that Saul is given this miraculous ability to prophesy. And people are astounded by it. It even becomes a proverb and a saying, Saul among the prophets. Prophetic ability. Now let's 
review this list that we've looked at so far. Interpreting dreams, artistic ability, leadership ability, prophetic ability, superhuman strength. And this is not a complete list by any means. This is just a representative list, a sampling. You say, okay, fine, but all of this is BP. What about now? Answer, after Pentecost, the floodgates get open. Let's look at what the Apostle Paul writes to the church after the day of Pentecost. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11. Paul says, writing to the church at Corinth, a spiritual gift is given to each one of us. Note that so that we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. There's one. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. There's another one. Verse 9, the same Spirit gives great faith. To another, he gives, let's see, to another and to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. And he gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. Well, let's consider a few observations, key observations on this passage. First of all, how many gifts were listed here? I underlined them. Anybody count them? Nine, that's right, nine gifts. I thought maybe they put the answer up there, but you got it. There are nine gifts that are listed here. And next, that's that's A, B on your outline, is that every Christian gets a gift. In verse 7, he said, to each of us is given a gift. So every Christian, without exception, has a gift, at least one gift, from the Holy Spirit. C, gifts are for helping the church. He says there in verse 7 that these gifts are are given to help each other, to help the body, to build us up. They're not for building ourselves up uh, alone, but helping others. And then D, it's the Spirit who decides who gets which gifts it's up to him it's not like you you know you go on amazon and you say well i'll take this one this one and that one and i don't care for that one i don't want no it's the holy spirit who decides what you get now here's a question for you think about this for a moment how many of these nine gifts This is just a sampling. There are other passages that list other gifts. But let's just look at this list. How many of these nine gifts do you see operating at Stony? Again, there are other gifts in other passages like the gift of evangelism or teaching or helps or uh, others. But of this list of nine, How many do you see operating? I know of maybe five of these nine operating at Stony. And of course, I don't know everything that goes on, uh, but I, I don't know of anyone with the gift of healing in our church or miracles or the interpretation of tongues And of the five that I have seen operating, some are in short supply. Maybe just one or two instances of that particular gift. As five gifts in a church of hundreds of people. In other words, there are hundreds of unopened gifts under the Stony Creek Christmas tree. Waiting, just waiting to be opened. 
Imagine what we could do for the Lord if we opened every gift, every unopened gift. Imagine the impact on the church, on our families, on our marriages, on the community. We'd call it revival. Do you know what your spiritual empowerment is? Are you using it? Might you have some unopened gift or gifts under the tree? In this series, we're going to seek God to open our eyes to our unopened gifts at Stony. Let's look at a second lesson about the Holy Spirit's BP activity. Number two, permanency is not guaranteed. You know, talent can be lost. An ability you have might be here today and gone tomorrow. One famous example is Julie Andrews. She had a world-class singing voice. She literally was the sound of music. Extraordinary gift. But a botched operation on her vocal cords in 1997 wrecked her singing voice. She can talk, but she can't sing. Can that sort of thing happen with a spiritual endowment? Can you lose your gift? Worse, might the Holy Spirit just leave you all together? If you mess up, might he ditch you the way he did with Saul? Well, <clears throat> let's look back to our BP survey of the Old Testament. Let's rewind to the story I recounted earlier about Moses. When God placed the Holy Spirit on the 70 elders of Israel so that Moses could get some relief from his leadership load, the event was, was awesome. God's glory cloud descends on these 70 elders. And let's pick up in uh, Numbers 11:25. It says, Then he gave the 70 elders the same spirit that was upon Moses, and when the Spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But this never happened again. That's fascinating. This never happened again. The Spirit rests on these 70 guys. They're given the ability to help Moses with his leadership responsibilities. And, as a bonus, they prophesy. The ability to help Moses stays throughout the rest of their ministry. But the ability to prophesy is a one-time deal. Why? Well, it appears in this case that the prophesying showed everyone that these guys did indeed have the, the Spirit's power upon them. It was like showing their badge, uh, their credentials, Yep, okay, these guys really are leaders along with Moses. But then it was taken away. Might the Holy Spirit give a gift temporarily, a one-timer? And then that's it. And what about the Holy Spirit's presence? Well, look at 1 Samuel 16, 14. It says, now the Spirit of the Lord had left Saul. And the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Under point one, we saw that the Holy Spirit comes upon Saul, giving him the, uh, the ability to prophesy. But later, Saul becomes proud, arrogant, full of himself. And he displeases the Lord with his disobedience. 
And the tragic result is seen in this verse. The Holy Spirit leaves Saul and God disciplines him with a a tormenting demon. The Lord does this. Now this, this raises some pretty spooky questions, doesn't it? Fascinating questions. Unfortunately, we don't have the time here to to probe those things. We're talking about the Holy Spirit, not the unholy spirit here today. But we see a milder version of this in the case of King David. Notice when David is anointed king of Israel, this is what happens. 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. Samuel, the prophet, took the flask of oil he had brought and anointed, that's a key word here, anointed David with the oil. And the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David from that day on. When oil is used for anointing, it symbolizes the power of the Holy Spirit coming on that person. It's not the oil that has any magical power. It's what it symbolizes, the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what the title Messiah is really all about. Messiah means anointed one. Anointed with the oil which symbolizes the Holy Spirit. See, every king of Israel, and then Judah, was the anointed one. The Messiah, the Mashiach, is the Hebrew for it. And he was intended to be a pointer toward the Mashiach, the Messiah to come, Jesus Christ, who would be anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. The Holy Spirit came down upon him and he became the Mashiach. And of course, David, receiving the Spirit like this, becoming the Anointed One, treasures the Holy Spirit's presence, helping him, enabling him to be a good king. But later in his reign, David sins terribly by committing adultery with Bathsheba and then arranging for her husband's death. And then when the prophet Nathan comes and confronts David with his sin. David confesses and he gushes this prayer of repentance to the Lord. It's recorded in Psalm 51, verse 11. This is David praying. He says to the Lord, Do not banish me from your presence and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Listen to the panic in his voice, in his prayer. My sin is serious. I realize this. And you are not a God to be trifled with, to be messed with. Don't banish me. Don't take the anointing away. Don't take away the Spirit from me. Now, what should we this side of Pentecost, learn from this. There's a lot to learn. Certainly, the Spirit's presence should not be taken for granted. We should cherish it. We, too, can grieve the Holy Spirit. Notice what Paul says in the New Testament in Ephesians 4.30. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own. As a Jesus follower, this side of Pentecost, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, a a house for Him. But when we think or act or speak in sinful ways, it grieves the Holy Spirit. If I harbor an angry attitude toward you, if I gossip about you, or if I get drunk, or watch pornography, 
or waste my time with entertainment and then make excuses about why I, I can't be at church or why I can't serve. I am grieving the Holy Spirit. If I came over to your house and I had with me a dead, stinking, rotting rat, I brought it into your house, you'd be grieved, wouldn't you? To say the least. You'd kick me out. You'd make sure I did not deposit the stinking thing on your lawn on my way out, right? Well, when I sin against the Holy Spirit, when you sin against the Holy Spirit, it's like bringing a stinking dead rat into the house of God, into his temple. It grieves him. Get that stinking thing out of here. Stinking up his house. Is the Holy Spirit doing a Nathan the prophet on you today? Telling you, as he told David centuries ago, you have sinned against the Lord. You need to repent. The Holy Spirit convicts me every day of my sin and prompts me to take a shower, a spiritual shower, to wash the stink off. Do you need that spiritual shower? Fresh today. Take that shower. Ditch the rotting rat. Let's look at the third lesson about the Holy Spirit's BP activity. Number three, a superior experience is promised for us. One more time, let's rewind to the story of Moses and the Holy Spirit's coming upon the 70 elders of Israel. We've got the continuing saga here today. We're told the Lord himself descends in a cloud and imparts the Holy Spirit to these 70 leaders, and they prophesy. It's an amazing sight. It's an unforgettable sight. But there's more to the story. Turns out, not all 70 of the guys showed up. There's always somebody who misses church. Turns out that two guys, Eldad and Medad, stay back at the camp. They are not part of this miraculous spectacle. We don't know why. Maybe they had COVID. Maybe they were out getting the pizza. Maybe they were watching online. We don't know. But then the freakiest thing happens. These two guys, even though they are not present when the God cloud descends, they begin to prophesy anyway, even though they stayed home. Look at uh, Numbers 11. We pick up in verse 27. A young man ran and reported to Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, the son of Nun, who had been Moses' assistant since his youth, protested, Moses, my master, make them stop. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them all. Moses says, you worried about me? You worried about my reputation? <laughs> Forget that. On the contrary, I wish that all God's people had the Holy Spirit come down on them and that all of them would be prophets. I love that. Amen. Way to go, Mo. Little did Moses know when he said this that centuries later his wish would come true. Fast forward several centuries to the prophet Joel. 
Now, Joel, we're still in the Old Testament here. We're still BP. But he looks forward to something that is going to happen and he prophesies, he predicts it. It's in Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. And afterward, he says, I will pour, this is God speaking through Joel, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Help me. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Mm. Praise God. That's really a marvelous prophecy. Joel foresees a glorious day, a day of a huge outpouring, not just on the leader or the minister or the godliest person, but on all of them, male and female, on his servants, that means those that are believers and are following him, will receive the Holy Spirit and they will prophesy. Okay, so then what happens? Answer, the day of Pentecost happens. Centuries later, Joel's prediction, says the Apostle Peter, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, begins to be fulfilled on that glorious day of Pentecost. Now note, Jesus, the night before he died, speaks of the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is in John chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. Still BP. Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on Pentecost about seven weeks from this time. Jesus says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. That's key. Verse 17, He is the Holy Spirit. You know Him because He lives with you. And later will be in you. That's key. He will be in you. Notice we're going to look at three key observations on this text. First of all, Jesus is speaking still during the BP era. He's still here on planet Earth. He hasn't died. He hasn't arisen. He hasn't ascended into heaven. He's speaking of the future. This future outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In other words, he's speaking AP, about AP, that is after Pentecost. B on your outline. AP, the Holy Spirit will never leave believers after Pentecost. In the past, as with Saul and potentially with David, the Holy Spirit might come and go. But AP, the Holy Spirit moves in to stay. He'll never ditch you like he did with Saul. C, contrast here, BP, the Holy Spirit is with them. But AP, the Holy Spirit is in them. Note the prepositions. In other words, he's going to personally indwell you. He's not just coming upon you. He's not just staying with you, but he's comes into you to indwell you personally and comfort you and counsel you. You become his headquarters, his house, his base of operations, his permanent temple. This is the superior experience, much greater than the BP experience. Now, 
everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord in repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is not only saved, but receives the Holy Spirit. Not just the super saint or the leader. And once he comes, he never leaves. And when he comes, he's not just with you or upon you, he's inside of you. This new AP experience was made possible by Jesus when he died for you on the cross, paid the penalty for your sins, and arose from the dead. He made atonement for our sins so that the temple, your body, could be purified and the Holy Spirit could come to live inside. My burden as senior pastor of Stony Creek Church is for all of us to enter into a deeper, richer, fuller experience of the presence of God the Holy Spirit. For us to open all of our unopened gifts for us to shed our fear of witnessing, to discover previously undiscovered gifts, strength, to love God with all our heart, to love our neighbor as ourselves, even the cranky neighbors, and to resist temptation and to go the extra mile in serving those in need. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit, but you would like to be, I'm asking you to come down today. Come down here, right in front of this platform, for prayer if you need a fresh infilling. Maybe you were filled yesterday, but today you're on empty. Come on down for a refill. If you wonder if you may have some unopened gifts, I'd like to pray over you to ask the Lord to open up those gifts, to release those gifts or that gift in your life today. If you're not a Jesus follower, but you say, I want to become one, come on down. The band is going to come up here and lead us in a song. First, I'm going to pray We're going to do something a little different. We did this at the first hour. During the song time, during the song, if you sense that you'd like to be prayed over by me or one of the members of our pastoral prayer team, come on down. While the song is is going on, come on down as the Spirit leads you. Maybe you need healing or a fresh filling or whatever it may be. Come on down. I'd like to pray of the Bible talks about the elders laying on the hands and gifts being imparted. I've seen that happen at Stoney. Let's see if we can get some more gifts opened up today. Hmm? Why don't you stand with me, please? And we're going to pray over our offering and then we'll have this song. Father in heaven, thank you for the precious gift of the Holy Spirit, your personal presence and power. May the Spirit come upon us powerfully, mightily. Lord, to gift us, to empower us to serve one another. Release your gifts today. There's somebody here who doesn't know they have a particular gift. May that person open that gift today. May it be released in that person today. Lord, we want everything you have for us. Not just some, but all of it. Give us all of it, Lord, and may we use it for your honor and glory. Father, we commit our tithes and offerings to you and ask that you would use them to advance the kingdom. We pray your blessing 
on every gift and every giver. In Jesus' name, amen.